Good morning, everybody, and thank you for attending today's webinar, which is provided by Seashell Family Services, PAX, which is Parents and Carers Together Stockport, and Steve Broach, who is a barrister at 39 Essex Chambers, and who specialises in the law affecting children and young people with disabilities. Steve is also the co-author of the book, Disabled Children, A Legal Handbook, published by Legal Expert. Uh, in today's webinar, Steve is going to go through the proposed legal changes in the Centre View Green Paper, looking at the potential positives and negatives from the perspective of children, young people and families. Today's webinar will consist of two sessions. Session one will be from 10 o'clock to 10 past 11, which will be followed by a short break, and then session two will run from 11.25 and we'll finish at 12.30. If you do have any questions, please can you use the Q&A function rather than the chat function and please keep any questions anonymous. Today's session will be recorded and will be available on the Seashell YouTube channel. I will now pass you across to Steve. Thanks ever so much and good morning everyone. Uh, very pleased to be back for uh, as part of this series of webinars on the law that we're doing with, with Seashell and with PACT. Absolutely brilliant organising as always. Thank you ever so much. And today uh, is going to be particularly interesting, I think, because we get to look at the uh, what might be coming next. I'm usually very strict when I do these talks about um, focusing on the law as it is now, because there have been a lot of proposed changes to the law over the years. And not all of them have gone through, of course, and it can be very uh, confusing and potentially detrimental to spend too much time looking at what the law might become uh, or what it should be and, and breaking for everyone to understand what their entitlements are now. But with that caveat in mind, uh, we do, of course, have a green paper, a set of proposals for reforms to the SEN disability system. And that's what we're going to spend this morning looking at, what the legal changes might be. Now, of course, the green paper uh, deals with much more than just the law. The law is only one part of the jigsaw, of course. But there are some potentially quite important changes to the law proposed in the green paper. And in some areas, I'd suggest there just isn't enough clarity about exactly what is proposed to understand whether the changes are positive or negative. But this is a consultation phase, and so very important that everyone concerned responds to the consultation. And that the hope is that this session will assist people to perhaps ask the questions that need to be asked to clarify um, what the law might look like uh, if the reforms go through. So I'll share my screen and show you where the green paper lives online, send review lives, and I'll put the link in the chat as well. And as I said, please do put any questions uh, in the Q&A rather than the chat, but I'll use the chat to provide access to uh, links as we go through. Let's close in the old emails. I can't read that there. Just trying to show anybody my confidential emails. Um, so the review, as we see, was published on the 29th of March and applies to England, because of course Wales is a separate SEN system. And we're told the government is seeking views on our green paper. What's a green paper? Well, it's distinct from a white paper. So a green paper is an official consultation document with official proposals, but where the government is still very much in listening mode. At the time a white paper is published, uh, the policy direction has been set, and white papers normally then, or not, not normally, often lead on to legislation in the form of a bill, which then becomes an act of parliament and, and changes the law. So we're at the earliest formal stage in that journey towards potential new legislation. And so what is being said here is that the government is seeking views on our green paper about the changes we want to make to the special educational needs and disabilities send and alternative provision, AP system in England. So that's interesting because immediately we're told that this is actually about two things. It's not just a send review, it's a send and AP review, effectively. And quite how alternative provision fits in to this mix is something that we can look at as we go through today, because of course, uh, large numbers of children will send, young people will send are not in alternative provision. Equally, I think the reason why it has been put in is that very large numbers of children and young people in the alternative provision system have sent. So it does make sense to look at the issues together, but they're not directly aligned. And we're told the government's consulting until 11.45 p.m. So you can get your responses in at 11.44 if you want to, not advised, on the 22nd of July. Now, the documents we've got, just I'll go down to those in a second before we get to the documents, the consultation description. Uh, the government's committed to improving outcomes. I think we all are. Uh, to achieve this ambition, we want to hear from everyone. To consider the proposals. So again, we're told these are not formal decisions. 
and uh, we've got then the documents that are available for people who want to engage with the consultation. We're going to be looking at the main send review document in a moment. And also important to note, there is now, it uh, wasn't originally, but there is now an easy read. There's a BSL version, and there's a guide for children and young people as well, which, which is obviously very important resources that can be shared. So the main send review, let's go into that. Oh, sorry, that's a large print. That's going to be helpful. Web accessible PDF, that sounds good. Let's try that one. So this is, as it said, called Right Support, Right Place, Right Time. Now, just a bit of context before we get into the detail. The SEND system is, was created by the Children and Families Act 2014, which of course itself followed a number of reviews and was intended to update and upgrade the uh, system that was in place under the Education Act 1996, created uh, what dealt with statements of special educational needs, and that built on a previous uh, pieces of legislation as well. So this is incremental change. What was really different then about the, the scheme that was introduced in 2014 and came into effect in 2015? So the old statements of SEN replaced by EHC plans, uh, a focus on a coordinated approach between education, health and social care, but still very different entitlements in the different areas with priority given to education. One very important change was uh, clarity that EHC plans went down to zero and a new extension of the plans up to 25 so long as the young person remained in uh, further education. Obviously, uh, controversially, to an extent, the EHC plans don't extend to higher education. So though, that was the, the real headline change that was introduced, along with some very important um, new principles in terms of focusing on outcomes, focusing on uh, what would be the best possible outcome for the child or young person in the language of Section 19 of the Children and Families. But I think it's fair to say, and I think the Green Paper recognises, there has been a very considerable dissatisfaction with the practical changes or the extent to which the new system introduced in 2015, so some seven years ago now, has resulted in practical benefits for children and young people. And there's a sense that there is a growing uh, level of conflict within the SEND system. The cause of that conflict is probably controversial. I suggest young people, families may well say it's because either local authorities and haven't got the right resources or they're not doing their jobs properly. Local authorities might say, and indeed did say in a fairly controversial uh, document produced shortly before the review came out, that a lot of this is about unreasonable expectations and the legislation creating uh, uh, a sense of entitlement to support that isn't realistic. So, there isn't a shared understanding, I would suggest at the moment, as to what's wrong and what needs to be put right. Uh, and it was very interesting to see what the consultation shows about that and, and whether there are very different themes in the responses from different groups. But we're gonna to focus today, of course, on the law. And so we see that it's an official paper presented to Parliament by the Secretary of State, so it's called a command paper, but it is a consultation as is made very clear. But it is a consultation on proposals. So it's not that, quite rightly that the government has a completely blank mind. Uh, an open mind isn't an empty mind, as, as the consultation case law makes clear. So it's not that they're consulting saying, well, what should we do? There are a series of proposed changes which uh, they, will, they intend to implement subject to what people say in the consultation. So we do need to take this seriously. It's likely that many of the things that are in the Green Paper will come into force and just this is the index here and just to briefly see what we're going to be looking at for those who haven't actually had a chance to look at the detail of this yet at all so we'll skip the executive summary essentially because we're going to go into the, the detail chapter one is in the case for change this is the what's gone wrong analysis and um, interesting just to look at the headings isn't it consistently poorer outcomes negative experiences financially unsustainable which is interesting too much inconsistency, vicious cycle. And what they're then looking for is a system where every child or young person can access the right support in the right place at the right time. And it is striking, of course, that we've just had, relatively speaking, radical system reform in 2014, 2015. But the, the short point uh, that you take from chapter one is it hasn't worked. What was done in that, at that time hasn't delivered the outcomes that were sought. Uh, and so what more can we do? And chapter two is then headed as the immediate response to that, 
a single national send and alternative provision system. So there's going to be an attempt to create more consistency, more national consistency. Very interesting to compare that with the uh, Children's Social Care Review we've just published, where the focus is more on localism in the form of local cooperatives uh, delivering just children's social care. Not necessarily a great deal of consistency there in the, in the direction of travel between the two reviews, I would say. So here we're going to have new national SEND standards, new local SEND partnerships to ensure effective local delivery, uh, mandating the use of local multi-agency panels to improve parental confidence. I'm not convinced that having a mandatory local multi-agency panel will improve parental confidence in the needs assessment process, but let's see that when we get to the detail. Standardizing EHCPs, well, I, I mean, I do think that's obviously a sensible idea because the, the variation at the moment in the format and the style of EHCPs is deeply unhelpful for anyone trying to get to grips with what they're supposed to look like. Uh, not necessarily something that needed a, a big review to be done, but there we go. Digitizing EHCPs, ditto, just the same, I would say. Amending the process for naming a place. Now, this I think is perhaps one of the most controversial proposals and where we definitely need some more information. Uh, and equally, I would suggest uh, strengthening earlier address. Well, through clear national standards, perhaps, but the introduction of mandatory mediation, I personally have real serious concerns about, and it'd be good to discuss that. So much of the legal reform is there in chapter two, and that's probably where we'll spend most of our time. There are, of course, important legal issues within uh, chapters three and onwards, uh, including, for example, uh, a new SENCO qualification that will be introduced. Uh, and then in terms of alternative provision, uh, it's less, I think, by way of legal reform, there is more policy, but we will we'll have a look at what that says about the law as well. Uh, system roles, accountability and funding reform, obviously very closely linked to the law. And then delivering changes, I think, much more policy driven, including the National SEND Delivery Board. Just stepping back then, before we go into the detail, what the SEND review doesn't do is propose to sweep it all away and start again. This is not going to see, for example, something other than the HC plan. It's also not, at the moment, proposed that, that, that an EHC plan will become a genuine tripartite document where the health and social care sections are equally as, as important and enforceable as the education section. Nothing on the table of that sort. So it might be said that some of this rather looks like tinkering around the edges. And one of the questions you, want, you might want to think about and, and answer in the response is, does this go far enough? If the SEND reforms, didn't, the SEND reforms of 2014-15 didn't work, will this? Is there enough here that will really make the difference? So I'll just go to the Q&A now before we go in, on into any of the detail. Uh, so there's a question which is, um, will SEND lawyers, barristers, or the SEND tribunal be making an official response? So I think we need to break that down. The tribunal may well do. It's obviously a matter for them. They're, they're the judges. In terms of lawyers and barristers, well, as individuals, I very much doubt we will make an official response because we're not official. Some, some of us may choose to put in a response as individuals, but there may well be organizations uh, that put in responses. I'm sure Ipsy, for example, will be making a response. And it may well be possible to feed into organisational responses as well. But I do think it's really important that the government hears directly from individual young people and families as well, as far as possible. Uh, and a question about, uh, which is an interesting one, about whether, why didn't things work under the Children and Families Act? Was there a uh, failure to ensure that section 19, for example, in terms of the uh, duty to have regard to various needs, including the need to help children and young people achieve best possible outcomes, wasn't, wasn't strong enough, wasn't enforceable enough. That may well be the case, but it's interesting that none of that features really in the review. So if there are issues with um, the current legal framework that you've identified that are not within the review, it's very important to um, point those out. I would suggest. Uh, the Children's Social Care Review, interestingly, a question that someone or comment that someone wasn't aware of it. That's the McAllister Review that's just come out. I think it was yesterday. That's right. It was late on Sunday night. And its focus is um, very much, I would suggest, on looked after children. But it is intended to be a review of children's social care. And there's a really good summary of the implications for disabled children 
on the uh, SEM jungle, especially the jungle uh, website uh, today, which does highlight that there's a, a grand total of 1.5 pages in the Children's Social Care Review specifically for disabled children. Uh, so it's not uh, going to take you that long to look at what's specifically proposed for our cohort. But some of the wider system reforms suggested there are going to be very important. For example, uh, mixing or bringing together the concept of early help, which is a, a policy concept set out in the Working Together to Safeguard Children guidance at the moment, with uh, Section 17 Children in Need statutory provision and creating a new category of family help, which I think could overall be quite good for disabled children and young people. But again, we need to see the detail. Now, the, the McAllister review is independent of government, structurally independent, and so it's up to the government to then respond to that. So it's not a green paper uh, in that sense. Will um, standardising EHC plans result in them being dumbed down? Possibly, again, as with many of these things, the devil's in the detail. But I think having a standard template and structure so that wherever you are in the country, the HCP looks the same and, and flows in the same way would be really helpful. So we don't get these very confusing local variations where some areas, for example, conflate sections E and F and put the outcomes and the provision together, or some areas put, uh, do the needs and then the provision for those needs and then the next set of needs and the provision for those needs. However, it ends up looking, I'd rather they all look the same in order that people can understand them better and get advice on them uh, in a more straightforward way. Uh, a question which might be said to be more of a comment, which is why are local authorities never penalised over their unlawful policies? Well, the, the short answer to that is that they are. Uh, where local authorities have unlawful policies, there are two main ways in which they can be challenged. First of all, uh, through judicial review, which is what I spend quite a lot of my time doing, and where local authorities lose judicial review cases, they will be ordered to pay the claimant's costs, which can be very significant, and will, of course, have the embarrassment of a High Court judge having said that what they're doing is unlawful. Or the ombudsman, many more cases, of course, go to the local government ombudsman through the complaints process, who again can make findings of maladministration and can uh, recommend, and those recommendations are almost always followed, quite significant compensation. So I, I wouldn't accept the premise of that question. There are ways to challenge local authorities. I do accept it, that none of them are straightforward. Certainly in terms of judicial review, it's um, a very expensive process and you're likely to need legal aid to take it forward, but it, it can be done and it is done. A very interesting question about the, the previous act, the previous scheme, before we get to the detail of these reforms. Was it the law itself that was the issue, or was it implementation? Well, I, I think a bit of both, frankly. I do think, looking back, that the Children and Families Bill was something of a missed opportunity, in the sense that EHC plans are effectively, as a matter of law, statements with health and social care bolted on. Now, the bolt-on for health is really important, because the duty in Section 42 of the Children and Families Act to, to uh, arrange the health provision in the plan was new. And that's a genuinely additional new entitlement. But in terms of social care, all that happened there was that the HC plans just sit on top of what is already a very messy scheme for children's social care for disabled children, involving the Children Act 1989, the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act 1970, etc. And one useful thing that the uh, Children's Social Care Review recommends is that the Law Commission needs to get hold of children's social care, disabled children's social care in particular, uh, and work out what the best way would be to um, modernise the law there, as they did for adult social care and resulted in the Care Act. So that's a useful step forward, I would suggest, although it's, an, it's yet another review, of course, not actually any immediate changes. So I do think that the Children and Families Bill was suboptimal in certain ways, shall we say, but then definitely challenges the implementation uh, in a context of reductions in funding, and then of course, more recently in the context of the pandemic, uh, it's not been the optimal environment in which for local authorities, schools and others to try and implement this new scheme, and arguably it was rushed as well in terms of the implementation. So I, I do hope that lessons will have been learned from the middle of uh, the last decade, which is not that long ago in uh, relative terms, in terms of getting it better this time round. See if there's anything else. Um, comment about the schools bill. So that's very important as well. There is, of course, linked to this a significant set of reforms in relation to schools generally, in particular in relation to academies um, so that, and funding. So there's a lot in the schools bill, which I confess I've not yet got my head around in full, uh, which 
will implement will impact on children and young people in SEND. And so it's important that the SEND review isn't seen in isolation. I absolutely agree with that. And so following up my the earlier question about, well, does the Green Paper deal with these concerns about either legal gaps or implementation? I think that my, my personal view is perhaps not, or certainly not sufficiently enough, but we'll see that as we go through. A question, a very interesting question, why is there nothing in the Green Paper? I didn't see what's in it yet, but it's correct. I think there is nothing in the Green Paper. To make education settings legally accountable to put in place provision at SE and support level and all deliver the content of Section F of the EHC Plan. Well, let me take those in stages. So SEN support is not a statutory level of, of entitlement in the sense that there's no obligation enforced by the Children and Families Act to provide provision uh, at SEN support. It's a policy construct. So the, it, it would be open to the government to legislate to create an SEN support entitlement that was delivered by schools. That isn't yet proposed. If you think it's a good idea, propose it. There, are, schools, of course, do have the duty in Section 66 of the Children and Families Act to use their best endeavours to secure all the special educational provision that children and young people need. So that's a very important uh, existing entitlement, but it's not um, going to be extended at the moment into a formal duty to secure SEN support provision. In terms of why don't schools have the obligation to, to deliver the content of Section F, the reason for that is that duty is, is fixed on local authorities in a context where the vast majority of schools are going to be academies. There's an open question I think, about whether that's appropriate. And it might be that it's better to fix that duty on schools instead. That might though have uh, negative consequences in terms of local authorities and their ability to provide an overview and provide support more generally to the system. I don't know. These are things that, again, it will be very helpful for um, to be flagged up in the consultation responses. Uh, the only mention of co-production with parent carers and children is that it was part of the 2014 code of practice. Uh, does it does it mean I don't know if that's right, but if it is, that's rather alarming, isn't it? Does this mean the parent care forums can expect not to be involved in developing sense services by the board? Well, I'd strongly suggest not, because as I say, this is not intended to be a complete, a completely new scheme. And we know that parent care forums were hugely important to the implementation of the Children and Families Act. And section 19. Uh, of, the, of that act, which no one's suggesting is going to be uh, repealed, is um, has, has at its centre a focus on the views and voices of children, young people and families, and parent care forums are a major way of, of delivering that. So I think that, that fear is probably misplaced, but it is interesting if it's correct that there's so little reference to co-production. Okay, well, I'll come back on some of those other questions in a, a little later, but let's make a bit more progress now into the, the, the content of the review. If everyone can still see my, um, my screen. And we've got there the Minister and the Secretary of State saying what they're trying to do. Uh, and they say, interestingly here, we know that too often children and young people with SEND and those educated and alternative provision feel unsupported. Their outcomes fall behind those their peers. Too many parents are navigating an adversarial system and face difficulty in delay and accessing support for their child. We know the pandemic has disproportionately impacted children and young people with SEND. Well, I think that's right. We do know all those things. And the interesting question is whether these proposals are sufficient to deal with what is probably a fairly good summary uh, of the experiences of, of too many children, and young people and families. So in terms of what's then being said that will be different. It's quite interesting always to look at the forward, I think, because that captures what the government is, is focusing on. It's this idea of a single national send and AP system, clear standards for the provision that children and young people should expect to receive, and the process that should be in place to access it. Proposals for strengthened accountabilities, query really, uh, are, are they going to be strengthened accountabilities? And investment that will help to deliver real change. So I suppose in a sense, measuring what is there, what is in the Green Paper against those goals would be an interesting uh, exercise as well. There's then some key facts, which we won't dwell on for today's purpose, but provide some useful background. Interesting, of course, that there's a focus here on the fact that high needs budget has written, risen by more than 40% over three years. Yes, but there does still seem to be a very significant level of unmet needs. So that's not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean I would suggest that money is being 
unnecessarily spent or there's been overly generous provision. I, it may be that the money's being wasted in certain areas, but that doesn't mean that um, there is still enough funding in the system, I would suggest. That might be an open question. So here's the executive summary, which I, again, I said I'd skip through because I don't want to spend uh, too long on, on the headlines when we get into the detail. But it is interesting to look at the three key challenges, I think. So the, the first key challenge, outcomes for children and people with STEM or in alternative provision are poor. So that's the government saying outcomes for our cohort are poor. It is worth noting, of course, that we have had new legislation less than a decade ago that simply hasn't worked on the government's own analysis. That does rather suggest that, that something quite different does need to be done. Otherwise, we'll be at risk of, of doing the same thing, i.e. completing a review cycle but not de delivering sufficient change. Navigating the system and AP is not a positive experience for children and young people and their families. Well, yes, I think, again, we can all agree with that. We've heard that for too many families, their experience of the same system is bureaucratic and adversarial rather than collaborative. Well, why? Why is that? Is it because people go into same work as professionals for local authorities, schools, and other bodies, looking to do down children and young people or, and their parents. I would strongly suggest that that's unlikely as a scenario. I would strongly suggest that the reason that that's what families experience is because the SEND system is inherently bureaucratic and adversarial. It's not that the people working there are, are wrong or bad, it's that the system has built within it tensions. And the almost obvious tension is between this duty to assess and identify and then meet needs no matter what, certainly in relation to education, no matter what the cost, the need must be met, but then also the budget supply. And we have to make sure we don't see the high needs budget continue to expand in the way it's been doing. And that is just inherently difficult to, to square. And, in, and therefore the bureaucracy, the system, uh, and the degree of adversarialness uh, increases, I would suggest. Too many parents and carers do not feel confident with local mainstream schools to meet their child's needs. One of the things that strikes me about the equality paper is how little there is about the equality angle. Because the obligation, the primary obligation on local mainstream schools being accessible to everyone stems from the equality act, and in particular from the reasonable adjustments duty under that act that was directly extended to schools, and including a duty to provide auxiliary aids and services between people as well as equipment. And yet there's so little focus here on whether or not schools are complying with those Equality Act duties. And that might, again, be something people could usefully point out. So again, I think people, many people on this call would agree with the statement, too many parents and carers not feel confident that local mainstream schools can meet their child's needs. But the, the, then of course, the next question is, well, why not? What, what is that lack of confidence? Are those parents and carers overly negative? I would suggest not. I would suggest that in reality, many local mainstream schools aren't meeting the needs of children, young people with a full range of, F of SCM. Why not? Are they under-resourced? Do they lack the expertise? Is there an insufficient focus on that group as opposed to other imperatives, exam results, for example? Uh, are people insufficiently aware or focused on their duties under the Equality Act? Uh, those with views about these things, please do uh, respond to the consultation, particularly where, you, where they can be evidenced, of course, as opposed to just asserted. But this analysis here is really quite bleak, I would suggest. The system relies on families engaging with multiple services and assessment, making it difficult to navigate. And what's really disappointing reading this is that as someone who was working in policy in the early 2000s, this is what would have been said then. Very, very similar to words that we would have seen in policy documents from 20 years ago when I started working in this area. So again, the, the clear conclusion that can be drawn is that the government thing, the government writing these words, of course, that what's been done hasn't worked and uh, things are sufficient, haven't changed sufficiently. And in particular at nine, the system is not equally accessible. Well, that's definitely right, not least because at the end of the, the dispute process is a tribunal, which only those who can afford lawyers are best placed, I would suggest, to navigate. Uh, but again, what, what are you going to do about that? I would suggest the answer to that isn't to level down, it's not to take away entitlement. It's to design a system which ensures that children and young people get what they're entitled to in the first place without the need for parents and carers to fight 
uh, as is too often the case at the moment. So I would suggest that's a very good and rather bleak summary of the problem. Um, what we need to focus on really is, well, what's the solution? Increasing appeal rates to the tribunal, demonstrating frustration, and identifying that the vast majority, 96%, were at least partly in favour of parental care. Now, that figure needs to be treated with a degree of caution in a number of ways. One point uh, that's worth making is that a num in a number of um, areas, failures to carry out annual reviews and make a decision at the end of an annual review actually frustrates parents' ability to even go to the tribunal. And there are cases where parents have to threaten or even bring judicial review proceedings just to get the decision that they can then appeal. But then on the 96% the success rate, that will include cases, of course, where the parents have won on one or two points but failed on a, on a bigger point, for example, a therapy provision or a placement. So at least partly is important to note there. But it is still striking that in, 90, in almost every case, 96%, uh, there are, uh, the tribunal does something to, to change the MC plan or to change the decision of the local authority in the parents' favour. Things are not going well. And then challenge three is, well, this is all costing loads of money as well, not, not, notwithstanding the fact the outcomes are poor and families are really unhappy. It's also costing a fortune, an unprecedented level of investment in high needs. But, of course, again, SEND doesn't exist in a vacuum. And uh, the finances are for the economists, not the lawyers. But my understanding is that the overall amount of money available in the system is lower than it was, or certainly hasn't increased in that kind of, at that kind of rate. So again, those who know about the, the finance side of things may want to interrogate those numbers uh, a little as well, uh, because notwithstanding the fact that the high needs budget has definitely been uh, increased, is there in fact overall more money available uh, for SEND than there was for example, 10 or 15 years ago, relatively speaking. A vicious cycle of late intervention, low confidence and inefficient resource allocation is driving these changes. Sometimes when you're reading the green paper, you have to stop and remind yourself, this is an official government document. This is, reads like an advocacy text. It reads like a campaigning report. But this is the government saying that the system they're responsible for it has, it has created a vicious cycle. It really does strike you that uh, there's an acceptance and understanding that things need to change. Too often decisions are made based on where a child or young person lives or is educated rather than their needs. Really quite striking. The current sense system does not prescribe in detail exactly who should provide and pay for local services, leaving it to local agreement and first tier send tribunals. I would strongly uh, question the second half of that, not for the tribunal, to decide who provides and pays for local services. All the tribunal does is orders local authorities to amend the HC plans to properly identify needs, provision, name of placement, and then make recommendations in relation to health and social care. But it is true to say that it's up, it's, uh, up to local areas to decide how the duties to secure and arrange the education and health provision are, are, are actually implemented on the ground. But that first sentence does strike me as rather worrying, and it would be useful, I think, for uh, people to point out that that's not how the tribunal works, it's not what the tribunal does. Uh, delivery across uh, alternative provision is inconsistent. I think that's entirely true as well. The reviewers consistently heard that these challenges are driven by a vicious cycle, late intervention, low confidence and inefficient allocation of support, which is driving the spiraling costs in the system. So, yes, it's really important not that the costs in the system don't spiral. My view is that that's a, a, a happy, the, the absence of spiraling costs will be a happy consequence of a system that's delivering effective outcomes for children and young people. And that's got to be where the focus is. So the view is that children and young people's needs are identified late, then escalate and become entrenched. Some of these, some of these sentences do seem a little glib with respect. Some children and young people do just have really significant needs and the law requires those needs to be met properly and in full, regardless of cost, albeit not necessarily uh, in the way the family want. They can be met in the most cost effective way, but they must be met. It's not always the case that if you identify needs earlier, you can stop them from escalating. And it's concerning if there's any suggestion that that's the case. 
inconsistent practice across the system exacerbate challenges. Yes, I think we can agree with that. As a result, parent carers and providers feel they have no choice but to seek EHC plans. Well, again, I say to that, EHC plans have a very clear legal test which is that the local authority accepts that it's necessary on balance for the special educational provision that child requires to be made in accordance with an EHC plan. And that's because either, primarily, because either the provision is expensive and costs more than a particular setting can reasonably be expected to pay itself, or because the child or young person needs to go to specialist provision. So there's nothing wrong with parent carers and providers, and it's not for providers, it's parent carers to uh, primarily, of course, to seek EHC plans. It's for the local authority to make the right decision as a matter of law as to who gets that plan. And of course, specialist provision may well be appropriate for certain children and young people. Equally, some families, including those with very comp children with young people with very complex needs, will want uh, their right to a mainstream place, consistent with the, the UK's human rights obligations to be delivered. So there's, there's a degree, I would suggest, of oversimplification in bits of the Green Paper. It does, doesn't fully reflect the nuance of the, of the current law. But it is, of course, the case that what's happening is resulting in significant delays. Whatever's causing those delays, we know that that's a real problem. Placements in alternative provision because of lengthy delays, well, we definitely don't want that. Increased numbers of placements in specialist provision also restricts capacity, interestingly. So there's a, a focus on not educating children and young people outside of their local area, which again, in principle, I'm sure we'd all support, but not if that results in restricted choice and children and young people going to provision that doesn't meet their needs. More children and young people get EHC plans and attend specialist settings. So the goal would have seemed to be expressly to reduce the number of EHC plans that are issued, as well as reducing the number of placements in specialist settings, because that pulls more financial resource and workforce capacity to the specialist end of the system. Well, as again, my, my view would be that what we want is a system where the right children and young people get EHC plans in accordance with the law, and the right children and young people attend specialist settings in accordance with the law, the assessment of their needs, and what the family wants. The, the, the goal of reducing EHC plans and, and attendance to specialist settings, apparently financially driven, is not the right approach. But all of this is then described as a vicious cycle outcomes and experiences for children and young people continuing to suffer. Again, really quite striking language and cost pressures increasing. And so the government then wants to turn this vicious cycle into a virtuous one. Uh, clear that in an effective and sustainable sense system that delivers great outcomes for children and young people, the vast majority of children and young people should be able to access the support they need to thrive without the need for an HC plan or a specialist alternative provision place. So that's now the, it's the stated policy intention, which I think was always the case, the vast majority. What does that mean? Is that 80%, 70%, 90%? It's not quite clear, but significantly more than 50% of children and young people won't have an EHC plan. Well, that's always been right. And won't go to a specialist or alternative provision setting. Again, that's always been right. This is because their needs would be identified promptly and appropriate support would be put in place at the earliest opportunity before needs can escalate. There's still this idea then that needs always escalate. They don't necessarily. Some children and young people just have very significant needs. And the mainstream, of course, should be accessible for those children and young people as well. Those children and young people who require an EHC plan or a specialist placement would be able to access it with minimal bureaucracy. Yes, please. So the intention is to shift the dial, setting out proposals for an inclusive system. Again, we've talked about an inclusive system for decades now, haven't we? That's not new. Starting with improved mainstream provision was built on early and ident accurate identification of needs, high quality teaching with knowledge rich curriculum, and prompt access to targeted support where it's needed. Again, absolutely nothing new in that intention. I've seen all that for years in every uh, policy document I've read, uh, both as a policy analyst and as a lawyer. Alongside that, we need a strong specialist sector with a clear purpose to support those children and young people with more complex needs who require specialist alternative provision. Yes, but of course, um, complex needs is a, um, a loaded term. So, um, one second, everyone, apologies. That's the executive summary. 
underpinned by strong co-production and accountability at every level and improved data collection. And what's then said is this green paper sets out an ambitious plan for how we'll deliver a more inclusive SEND system. Apologies, I just need to take a two minute break. So I'll just turn my video and camera off and come back and then look at what's actually being proposed. Apologies about that, everyone. Joys of working from home. Uh, close my Zoom box so you can all see the screen again. What I'll do before I go to the proposals, the summary proposals, I'll just go back to the Q&A and see if there are any other questions that I want to pick up at this stage. So an interesting question about whether there needs to be set training standards for local authority case workers in terms of understanding the law, co-production, et cetera. In my view is yes, there does. And that isn't necessarily a group of professionals that there's much focus on within the Green Paper. We've seen already there's going to be new SENCO qualification. How about a qualification for local authority SEND officers? I'm not sure at the moment that there is one, but I think that's a very interesting idea. And a point that responds to something I said earlier about the tribunal and uh, whether or not you need expensive lawyers. Well, no, you certainly don't need expensive lawyers. And um, it is the case that many unrepresented parents do a fantastic job and win, uh, as we've seen overwhelmingly. But I would suggest in the, in the case that I'm instructed on, it's almost always the case that a point of law or more comes up because inherently barristers will only be instructed on the more complicated cases. If it's a straightforward refusal to assess case, it absolutely may well not be necessary to have any legally qualified representation. It's never necessary to have any legally qualified representation. And the question I think will be, is it desirable? And that's something that families will be much better to, to comment on uh, than I am. But what I do find striking is the number of lawyers, parent lawyers who instruct lawyers, specialist lawyers to represent them in the tribunal because they themselves wouldn't want to represent themselves in, in a, such a difficult and emotional uh, environment as the tribunal can be. So it's, it's an interesting question, one I don't think I have a definitive answer to. So there's various points that are coming in about issues that are I'm about to deal with later in the Green Paper. So I'll come back to many of the other questions. So in terms of the summary of proposals, we've seen some of this already from the index. First of all, new national SEND and AP system with nationally consistent standards. Review and update the SEND code of practice, well, of course, obviously needs that. New local SEND partnerships. I mean, how far does that really go from the cooperation obligations that are already in the uh, Children and Families Act? Producing a, no, a new local inclusion plan. Well, again, the content of that plan will, you, will determine whether or not it makes any difference. Standardise and digitise the HCP processing template, yes, please. That's obviously a good thing, I would suggest. Supporting parents and carers to express an informed preference for a suitable placement by providing a tailored list of settings. This is the one that makes my alarm bells ring, and we'll come on to that when we look at it in a moment. And streamlining the redress process. I'm not sure you can accurately describe making, uh, creating an extra stage of mandatory mediation, streamlining anything. Again, we'll see that in a moment. And then we've seen the other areas where there's less law involved, much more about funding and policy as we skip through those. See those as we roll through. So the case of change, I, I'm not sure we need to spend much more time on this. I, I very much doubt there's many people on, on this call who would say, don't change a thing. Everything's going really well at the moment. So, of course, comment on the case for change, add reasons why change is needed, but uh, it's unlikely that there's going to be anyone saying no change. Thank you very much. And we've seen already in headline terms what is said about these areas of, of concern in the executive summary, the three main areas of concern. And here's a picture of the vicious cycle. Lack of common understanding, incentives and shared priorities misaligned accountabilities, inefficient use of funding, perverse incentives and delays. Needs escalate, family, school, CGDHC plans and top-up funding. Well, not always, again. Lack of confidence, low inclusivity and poor experience in mainstream. Decision-making results in cost of placements, resources directed from mainstream to fund increasing numbers of individualized placements, well, only if there's a fixed budget, of course. And so it goes on. Really is, again, striking that this is here in an go official government document 
describing the government's SEN system as, it's, as it works at the moment. And some more analysis as to why this is. And this, then this, as we know, is what they want, a system where every child and young person can access the right support in the right place at the right time. But that's clearly what all of us want. So here we go, chapter two. This is how they're going to do it. A single national send and alternative provision system. A need for much greater consistency in how needs are identified and supported. So that decisions about support and provision are made based on the child or young person's needs and co-production with families. Well, that's absolutely what the current law requires. Anyone who isn't doing that at the moment is acting unlawfully. And, and as has been pointed out, what's not clear from, from here is if that's the case, and if there's lots and lots of, of decisions being made where which aren't about children and young people's needs and aren't made in co-production with families, what on earth is going to happen to stop that? Where's the accountability? Because it's not realistic to expect that thousands and thousands of families are going to bring applications for judicial, judicial review, and I very much doubt that's what the government wants. They don't want any more tribunal appeals, and it's also a very inefficient way to police the system because the tribunal is only concerned with the particular child or young person that's in front of it. And equally, the ombudsman can't cope with doubling the number of complaints, for example. So what's the solution to this? Is it what we now find are going to go on to hear about in chapter two? So a new national central alternative provision system that will set new standards for how needs are identified and met across education, health and social care, including standards on what support to be made available universally in mainstream settings as well as guidance on what an EHC plan is required and when specialist provision is most appropriate. So some immediate questions that, that spring to mind. Well, what, what is a standard? Is it going to be a legal rule? Is it going to be something that's set out in legislation, for example, in regulation? Or is it going to be in statutory guidance, like the code of practice? Or is it going to be in best practice guidance? So how, how relevant is that standard? How much weight will it be given? Will it have to be given by people on the ground? will depend on the form it takes. And then of course, perhaps even more importantly, what's it going to say? What will the standard be? So well, we did say we're going to have standards, but what will it be? And that of course is going to be for further down the line. So they're going to set out what the new national standards will cover and how they'll be delivered. So we see then that there'll be these new national standards updating the code of practice, of course that will have to happen. And then new local SEND partnerships. Again, I query how much that's different to what should already be happening on the ground to deliver the cooperation duties in the Children and Families Act, amongst other bits of legislation. And then there's lots of things that are supposed to happen. Children and young people will be able to access the support they need without bureaucracy and delay. Parents and carers can be confident their child's needs will be met effectively without having to fight. And these are all good things, but I'm not sure that, that having willed the ends, this green paper actually willed the means to deliver that. So the national standards we know will be in legislation, or at least they will legislate for them, to be that the legislation then requires them to be set out in guidance. And it said there's too much local discretion in the system. And now there are now in effect 152 local send and alternative provision systems operating across the country. One again asked the question, who's responsible for that? How has that been allowed to happen? Difficult parents care as navigating the system. So we have these new standards spanning early years settings for FE, not higher education still, making consistent provision processes and systems that should be made available across the country. So provision, but also processes and systems, the things you have to go through to get the provision, acting as a common point of reference for every partner within the central alternative provision system. We intend for these to apply across education, health and care. That's going to be interesting, given that the statutory schemes are so different. And the legislation will place the standards on a statutory footing within the early years and education sectors. Big gap there, isn't there? What about health and social care? And revise the same code of practice to reflect those standards. Recognising the different needs of families for health and social care, adult social care, not children's, rated 18 to 25. They will work with parts of relevant bodies to ensure they're appropriate for them. Tie up with the Care Act. And the application of the national standards of children's social care will be informed by the government's response to the McAllister review, the independent review of children's social care, which, as we know, says very little about disabled children. The proposed national standards will include, as you'd expect, how needs should be identified and assessed, consistent processes for decision making on how needs are identified and recorded, 
and instruct, so they sound like they're going to be quite mandatory, on how and when an assessment should take place. Well, the law tells you that already in the Children and Families Act, Section 36, and the regulations. And should, who should be involved in the assessment process? Again, that's in the regulations, Regulation 6, and how the information and evidence collected should be recorded and monitored. This will include standards on how and when a child or young person should be identified as requiring a sense of support. So there'll be some kind of statutory underpinning under sense of support, it seems. And best practice and reasonable adjustments for disabled children. So are the standards then going to do what's always been thought to be impossible, which is tell people what the reasonable adjustments are? It's always been said, well, it's whatever is reasonable for that child. But it looks like there's going to be some kind of guidance on the, uh, in relation to the equality activities here as well, although no, no mention of the equality. The appropriate provision that should be made available for different types of need. Now, I can see that being hugely controversial, depending on, again, exactly what this means. There was some debate when this came out as to what precisely that means. The national standards will set out the full range of appropriate types of support and placement for meeting different needs. OK, I'm going to go straight to the most controversial question. Is ABA an appropriate way of meeting the needs of children with autism? The NICE guidelines, as I understand it, says yes, but other people might take a different view. So there's going to be undoubtedly controversy about what provision should be made available within these national standards for different types of need, if it's going to get as granular as that, starting to set out approved interventions for certain areas of need. It's supposed to include the support that should be made ordinarily available in mainstream settings. Very, very interesting to see how that might be defined. So we'll see, how, again, the devil in that area is all in the detail, I would suggest. Standardised processes for accessing and reviewing support. Well, I think when we're dealing with process points, it's going to be much more straightforward, relatively speaking, than when we're dealing with points about substantive provision. Because it is clear you can have standards on, for example, co-production with children and young people. It be a good thing. Standards for co-producing and communicating, specifically with children and young people, is next up and then standards for transitions. So I have no pr problem with this as an idea. Is it, does it have the potential to be the kind of game changer that the government seems to think it is? It's the first proposal having set out this really quite dreadful picture about the current state of the SEND system. Will these new national standards make a significant contribution to changing that? I would suggest that people make that point in here in response to question one, as well as answering what key factors should be considered when developing the national standards. Now we've got the new local partnerships, greater fairness and consistency in decision making, but some local discretion will be required. And so they want to legislate against, there'll be new, a new bill we've told, uh, one assumes to enable the statutory local SEND partnership arrangements, which you can already have under the Children and Families Act if you choose to do so. So perhaps it's turning what's effectively a power into a duty. Partnerships will be convened by local authorities will continue to hold responsibility for high needs funding. So we're not abolishing the high needs funding system and coordinate the local system. Statutory guidance, presumably in the code of practice, will then be clear about how that's all going to work. And that what they're going to do, as they say, is to keep review the current cooperation duties and the requirements to keep education and care provision under review in the Children and Families Act. So there's a recognition that this all needs to work with the existing statutory scheme, which may need to be amended to specifically take account of it. And then there's going to be this new local inclusion plan, setting out a strategic plan for delivery, including setting out the provision of services that should be commissioned. Who's going to make sure this is done? One assumes Ofsted in their local area inspection. So the question then is, how should we develop the proposal for new local SIN partnerships? I would again suggest answering a slightly different question, perhaps, which is, do we think that this is going to work? What will be the necessary ingredients for this to be a major contributor to improving the system? There's a, a, a variant, perhaps, on question three. Now we come on to some proposals that one might think are slightly more controversial in terms of, first of all, the use of local multi-agency panels. We've heard from parents that improving the impartiality of the needs assessment process will improve their overall confidence in DMC needs assessments. So this seems to be all about need, the needs assessment process. We know local authorities also use panels in terms of allocating resources and deciding what should go in EHC plans. That doesn't seem 
to have met with approval as certainly not being mandated anyway. So the statutory local multi-agency planners will review and make recommendations on requests for EHC needs assessments. Ah, no, sorry, I missed something. The needs assessments themselves and the consequent placement and funding decision. So in fact, the title's misleading because it seems that the panels will also be um, relevant to the decision that comes out of the assessment, i.e. should the young person have a plan, should the young person have a plan, and if so, what should it say? The panel will include representation from schools and colleges, health, social care, parents and carers. So parents will be on this statutory panel, at least representatives of, a very onerous responsibility, one might think, and they would make recommendations to the local authority on whether following the decision-making process set out in law and the HC needs assessment must be carried out, whether or not the HCP is required, and that the provision specified in the plan is in accordance with the national model. So according to this, they don't seem to have a role in, a, in a, what the needs section of the plan should say. It's also not clear, although they are described as multi-agency, to the extent to which the panels will have um, recommendation making powers in relation to social care and health. I do have concerns. This is just going to add another layer of bureaucracy. I can see that in some areas, the panel may be uh, an effective check on the local authority. It will, of course, as usual in the system, depend on the people who are on it and what they consider their roles to be. But I'm not sure, again, that this is going to be a game changer. Standardising HC plans to ensure consistent access to specialist provision. Well, I'm not sure standardising HC plans will ensure consistent access to specialist provision. What it will mean is that there's some consistency in how the plans look, how they're structured, and that will help people in terms of being able to understand them better if they will look and feel the same in uh, every area. There'll be standardised HC templates and processes. This will place greater focus on the support that's being put in place, including whether support should be classed as education, health and care interventions. Really don't understand that. Any lawful EHC plan at the moment will already be crystal clear as to whether or not provision is education, health or social care, because that will depend on whether it goes in section FG or A to the plan and therefore funded by the appropriate service. Well, again, the law is crystal clear. If it's in section F or H, the local authority's got to fund it in terms of got to make it happen. And if it's in section G, the CCG as it is now almost always has to fund it, otherwise NHS England. So not sure why those sentences uh, are necessary, frankly. The national standards will make clear the input required for different services to contribute to an EHC needs assessment. Sure, but that seems to me to be a different point because we're here talking about the structure of the plan. And there's going to be an explore, exploration of opportunities for streamlining the EHC and social care assessments following publication of the independent review. Well, we'll see what happens now about that. We'll also review whether the distinction between section H1 and section H2 remains helpful and necessary. Well, whether it's helpful or not, it's clearly necessary until you've sorted out the law on children's social care, because it's only the provision that has to be made under the CSDPA 1970, plus accommodation under section 20 of the children, that actually has to be done because services uh, are provided under section 17 for children in need generally under a general duty, which doesn't give rise to an enforceable right to provision. So that, again, I suggest that, that review of whether the distinction between H1 and H2 is helpful and necessary puts the cart before the horse. What they really need to do is get on with sorting out the law on disabled children and social care, and then we can have a more sensible structure for the EHC plan. We will standardise the annual review process for reviewing EHC plans. Well, that would be good because we know in many areas it's just not done properly at all in some cases. Uh, requiring to discuss and record whether a step down to targeted support and a session with the EHC plan is more appropriate. And I can see alarm bells ringing there from the parent side, although that is always supposed to happen as part of an annual review. And paragraph 19 then deals with a very specific point, which is in the recent Devon uh, judgment, and I declare an interest as I acted for the claimant families in that case. Uh, the High Court held that there is in fact a fixed time frame or producing an amended EHC plan after an annual review, if you're going to do that, uh, with a total, total of 12 weeks, uh, four weeks from uh, the one stage of the process being four weeks. And the government seems to think that that's not a good thing because uh, this deadline is said, the concern is this deadline doesn't strike a balance between timeliness and certainty for families and enabling local authorities to gather and consider all the information and advice, the judge in the Devon case. Made it clear, of course, they should have been doing a lot of that already in order to prepare for the annual review meeting. And given that a, a year is 52 weeks, to have 12 weeks 
to, to complete the annual review. It does seem a reasonable amount of time, at least in my view, uh, but it'll be for you all to say whether that's right or not. Of course, The proposal is to consult specifically on a time scale, which one assumes will be more generous than the way in which the High Court interpreted the existing SEND regulations. There's then a section on digitizing the plans to reduce bureaucracy. Seems pretty obvious that in 2022, there should be a digital EHC for the template and a secure central location. Well, I can see the data protection issues arising from that. And certainly to have a digital template seems to be a very good idea, I would suggest. And the fact that you can even have pictures and videos would be very good as well, no doubt. But interestingly, if we look at the consultation questions, there's no consultation questions specific to some of the things we've just been looking at. Mandating local agency panels, no question. Standardizing EHC plans, no question. So the first question, the next question is about the standardizing digitized, to be fair, for which components of the EHC plan should we consider? So it's so nothing specific about planning. It's a one composite question on standardization and digitization. So then the next question, which I probably, will probably take after the break because it's one that's very controversial, I suggest, is about amending the process for naming a place, which is a rather neutral way of putting what could be a, a rather concerning proposal. Let's just see if there are any other questions that I need to deal with here. Um, very grateful if uh, attendees couldn't, could avoid putting just comments in the question box because it's making it very difficult for me to see whether there are actual questions that people would like me to answer. Uh, so just getting rid of, of a few comments. And a very important question I suggest, how can local authorities coordinate provision when they have no powers over some schools, which is academies, and all schools will be academies under the white paper? I don't know. It's a very good question. Of course, the whole purpose of the canonization is to remove schools from local authority control. And it does feel there's a certain Alice in Wonderland flavour here that local authorities are going to be somehow in charge of a system where all schools are outside of their control. I imagine the, the answer to that would be effective partnership working, but it does place a huge onus on local authorities being able to persuade academies to work effectively. And that may well be a very good question to ask as part of the consultation. Do I feel that given the focus on local area and plan, plans and panels that the offset and CQC local area inspection should be strengthened. Yes, definitely. My view is that the only way that any of this is going to work is if there's a really rigorous uh, inspection program. It was striking that the inspections under the Children of Families Act were only ready several years after the Act was implemented. I would suggest that might be the wrong way around, that we need to be ready to inspect compliance as soon as this new system uh, such as it is, goes live. So I very much agree with that. Parents say that if the panel says no, if the parent is left to negotiate with the school to improve support for their child, will the reforms address this? Very, very good question. No, there, I don't think there's anything to suggest that there's a sort of halfway out where if there's no EHC plan to be issued, the local authority will act as an advocate or a broker to try and ensure SEN support is made. In that situation, it will be again for the parents and the school to liaise, I think. But it's again a point that could be made in, helpfully made in the consultation. Uh, there's very little focus on higher education. I think that's entirely true. Uh, will there still be the possibility to request home education or EOTAS on the EHC plan? Well, we'll come on to that. But my understanding is that the right to have education otherwise than at school will be um, retained. But everything's up for grabs because at the moment it's only a consultation stage. Thanks very much, everyone. I will come back to uh, questions, more questions at the end. But if we take our 15 minute break now, come back at 11.25, we can then look uh, in more detail at some of the remaining legal changes that are proposed in the Green Paper. Thank you all. Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you were able to uh, refresh yourself. Sorry that I couldn't, we can provide you with refreshments and uh, hope that the standard at home was up to scratch. We were just about to look at the uh, detailed proposals in the EHC plan uh, section of the green paper. 
and um, the first of those, which as I said was perhaps very controversial, is proposing to amend the process for naming a place within the HC plan. Now just briefly, the current process is uh, as follows. The decision to issue an EHC plan is made and a draft EHC plan is sent to the family, which will have uh, no school or college named in section I, and the family will be invited to make representations as to what the school or college should be named in section I. And on receipt of those representations, the local authority considers the matter and then names or doesn't name that school. And if the family don't like the school's name, that's one of the issues on which they have um, the right of appeal. Now, it doesn't strike me that there's anything particularly wrong with that process. But what's said is that there needs to be some change, or that at least proposal that this will be changed. So that in instances where it's been identified that a child or young person's needs require a place within specialist provision, the local inclusion plan will set out the provision that's available within the local area, including units within mainstream alternative and specialist provision. Okay, that's good. Uh, the local offer is already supposed to do that. It's supposed to set out all provision that's uh, expected to be available within and outside the local authority area. So I'm not sure why that's new, other than it's got a new title. And then at 25, in order to support parents and carers to express an informed preference of a suitable placement, they will be provided with a tailored list of settings based on the local inclusion plan, including mainstream specialists and independents that are appropriate to meet the child or young person's needs. Hang on a sec, who decides that? Who decides they're appropriate to meet the child or young person's needs? Because it does sound rather like that's the local authority deciding that. But I'm sure many families wouldn't be happy with a restricted list of predetermined options that the local authority has decided are appropriate to meet the child or young person's needs. These settings may be outside of the boundary of the local authority or this is appropriate good. The local authority will allocate the first available place in order of the parents or carers preference and this school will be named in the child's EHC plan. So it sounds rather like instead of having a free choice at the moment of any school or college, the local authority gets to produce its own tailored list of settings, which it decides are appropriate and appropriate for appropriateness includes resource considerations, of course, to meet the child or young person's needs. This seems to me like a fetter on family choice, that they will no longer even be able to express a preference for, for example, a very expensive specialist setting that they think is the only place they can meet their child's needs. Parents will continue to have the right to request a mainstream setting for their child. Good. Otherwise, we'd be in breach of our international law obligations. Local authorities must name the mainstream setting where it's the parental preference, unless it's incompatible with the provision of efficient education for others. Well, that sounds, if that's an accurate summary, like an enhanced right to a specific mainstream place, which would be rather good, but we'll see if that's just a, a, a shorthand in the green paper. These changes will not impact children or young people who are already in a specialist setting, will apply to future decisions about school places, question mark annual reviews, won't come into effect until the inclusion, local inclusion plan for an area has been quality assured and signed off. Well, sure, but why do we need to do this? What's the, what's the reason behind limiting parental choice as it seems to be here? Because already the information provision duties mean that local authorities should be helping parent and carers, parents and carers to express an informed preference. Take the list of settings. Well, I can, see, I can see why it might be helpful for parents to have a suggested list. But that's not really what's happening here, as I understand it. It's that instead of having free choice, they'll have a fetid choice of a specific list of predetermined options. And I would be very unsurprised if those lists did not include the more expensive, for example, non-maintained special school places. So it seems to me that from a, a perspective of parental choice and, and children and young people's rights, this is not a, a positive development. But that's a matter that obviously each person responding to the consultation will need to take their own from their own view of that. Um, for children and young people within the HC plan, the setting name of the plan has a legal duty, already has, as we see, a legal duty to admit the child or young person. We are aware of instances of alleged inappropriate or unlawful practices. 94% of local authorities said that resistance from some schools to admit or retain pupils with additional needs or vulnerabilities happened occasionally or regularly. Yes, but that's not the same thing. Many of those pupils with additional needs or vulnerabilities won't have an EHC plan. 
and they may well be resistant schools to admit or retain those pupils. But are we saying that 94% of local authorities have schools that are blatantly flouting the law in terms of not complying with the duty to admit a child or young person with an EHC plan? That would be very surprising, I suggest. There are processes to allow local authorities to correct admissions in maintained schools. Although academies are required to admit a child or young person with an EHC plan, correct. The power to direct admissions for academies remains with the Secretary of State. That's right. Consider changing this process so local authorities have a backstop power to direct trusts to admit children. Sure, OK, but they've already got the duty to do so under the EHC plan. So really not obvious to me why that is a significant change. And it's interesting to look at the consultation question here. How can parents and local authorities most effectively work together to produce a tailored list of placements that's appropriate for their child? Well, that rather presupposes that the whole thing is a good idea, which I would have uh, some serious concerns about. So I do think this is an area of the consultation that definitely merits a particular uh, focus in people's responses. Is there an Equality Act consideration? in relation to this list of schools. This doesn't happen for children with no special educational needs. It's very interesting, isn't it? Because on one hand, we say this is a enhanced scheme for children, disabled children, those with special educational needs, but equally it does feel rather like a less <laughs> um, advantageous scheme because their, their choice of school will be limited. Whereas children, parents with children and young people with, uh, who are typically developing can make a free choice of all available local schools. I think it depends which end of the telescope uh, you look at that from. What might happen if all the schools on the local authority list say they can't meet needs? Great question. Who knows? As I said, there's a lot more detail that's needed here. Would the um, list of schools include independent special schools, those that aren't currently on the Secretary of State's approved list under Section 41? I don't know. Definitely a good question to ask. Um, how will this review address the fact there's a severe lack of provision in school places in many areas? Well, it doesn't. Does the schools bill do that? Need to check. It's not entirely clear to me that anyone has really grappled with that. Certainly not here. I and mean, when we get to the final chapter, of course, there is a focus on resourcing the, uh, the system better. Whether that's adequate or not is probably not for a lawyer to comment on. When will the changes take place? We just don't know. It, this all has to, of course, some of it will have to be legislated for, and it's very difficult to know um, how long any legislation will go through, will take to go through. So, suggestion, is this, is this going to result in fettering of discretion, which is a legal public law concept? And the answer to that is no, because that, that, this, that fettering concept of local authority or any public body can't fetter its discretion only applies if they have a broad discretion, but here it would be Parliament limiting the discretion to name any particular uh, school to that list. And so that would be them complying with their duty rather than to a discretion. Really interesting question about digital poverty and the fact that if all of this is moving online, we need to make sure that families are properly supported to engage with that. And there may well be discrimination uh, implications if that's not done. Well, that's that next. Uh, issue that we've looked at. And then another one that you may be able to tell I'm not particularly keen on is strengthening earlier address through clear national standards and the introduction of mandatory mediation. So again, what do we have at the moment? This was controversial when the Children and Families Bill went through. And it does feel sometimes like we're reinventing the wheel here. There isn't a, a, enough of an institutional memory about the debates that took place in relation to the Children and Families Bill. But it was proposed at one point that mediation should be compulsory when the Children and Families Bill was going through. And I would say happily, that was ultimately not what happened. And instead, there's the requirement to consider mediation. People will be aware that before you appeal to the tribunal, in most cases, you need to have obtained a mediation certificate to say either you have mediated or you've thought about mediating and you've decided not to do so. And I can understand that. But I have real problems conceptually with the idea of mandatory mediation. So you, you're in dispute with your local authority and before you're going to be allowed to go to the independent body that resolves that dispute, we're going to make you mediate with them, we're going to make you talk together to see if you can sort things out. Not completely impossible, of course. There is an open question as to whether it's human rights compliant uh, and compliant with the common law to make parties to legal disputes mediate, but the, the general thinking moment is that it is. 
So it's possibly it's probably something the government can do, whether they should do it or not, is a matter for you all to help them with in the consultation response. So through the national system, we will set standards for how complaints relating to send process and provision should be dealt with. This is very interesting because at the moment, the ombudsman, local government ombudsman, takes the view that uh, any complaint that is concerning an issue in relation to a tribunal appeal or where there could be an appeal to the tribunal will not be looked at. And there's a judgment uh, going to be coming out about those, those issues next month. Um, but perhaps there will be greater clarity here then about when uh, parents can make complaints, for example, about maladministration in the context of a tribunal appeal or in, the, in relation to the decision as to which school should be named as a plan. So that's paragraph 30. Paragraph 31, mediation helps to maintain and improve relationships between providers, local authorities and families. Yes, when it's done well. In the current system, quite rightly, families must secure a mediation certificate, not difficult. But they don't have to go through mediation itself. We propose to change this so that families and local authorities must engage in mediation prior even to registering an appeal to the tribunal. So it's not even that you'll be able to issue your appeal and then try and mediate to avoid the tribunal hearing. You have to go through the mediation even before you can register the appeal. And the national standards will set clear expectations of how different parties should engage, including timescales for mediation to take place and ensuring that local authority decision makers attend meetings. Make sure there is appropriate support available to parents to help them understand the mediation process and how best to engage with it. But of course, there won't be legal aid and there won't be any funding for people to have lawyers, whereas the local authority has access to legal advice. So is that fair? Is it appropriate for a mediation to be enforced in a situation where very many uh, perhaps participants on one side won't be able to access a lawyer? And is it even appropriate to be mediating disputes as to provision for children with special educational needs on a, on a routine basis? Mediation works really well, for example, in commercial disputes where both parties are happy to accept a compromise to avoid the costs of going to court. But if you've got evidence as a parent that what your child needs is an hour a week of speech and language therapy, but the local authorities say, well, look, let's compromise, let's go for an hour a fortnight. Is it appropriate for you to accept that com compromise? Should you be in a position where you're being encouraged to avoid the tribunal in order to compromise the, the claim and to compromise the claim in order to avoid the hearing? When actually what you're trying to do is get what your child has been assessed as needing. I think those are really interesting questions that I'd be very keen for people to, to come back on in the consultation response. So it said we will do this. Of course, these are all proposals we're told. And, and my, so my response to the consultation, if I make one, is going to be to say that I don't think this should go ahead. I don't think there should be mandatory mediation. It's also very interesting to see What's then proposed in paragraph 32? We propose to keep the impact of mandatory mediation under review. If the national standards of mandatory mediation does not prove effective in strengthening earlier redress, and that suggests if people are still peskily exercising their right of appeal to the tribunal, we will consider whether it's necessary to introduce an additional redress measure in the form of an independent review mechanism. So that's one way of putting it, an additional redress measure. Another way of putting it might be an additional hurdle that you have to get over before you can finally get to the independent tribunal. This could be the same multi-agency panel proposed in paragraph 13 that reviews evidence of the EHC needs assessment state. So this panel that previously was making recommendations as to the needs assessment, but also we're now told provision and placement, would also now potentially, they say consider, uh, be part of the process of redress if you're unhappy with the final decision which is an interesting way of doing things. And in those circumstances, the panel will be responsible for reviewing the evidence in any dispute cases that are eligible for tribunal appeal. Cases will need to go to mediation first and then be reviewed by the independent panel prior to a tribunal appeal being registered. So what's being suggested is the parents will have to go through three stages, mediation, independent local review, and then the tribunal. We would need to consider whether this panel can make binding legal judgments required to overturn previous local authority decisions, as, for example, uh, in some exclusion panels uh, certainly used to be able to do, uh, and admission appeal panels still can do, or if it's going to be uh, yet another recommendation making function. But really, here, I would suggest what's being proposed is more bureaucracy, additional steps, additional hurdles put in the way of families accessing 
the body that has been set up uh, to provide an independent adjudication of disputes, which is the tribunal. Why is it such a problem that uh, parents are appealing to the tribunal? And isn't the way to stop tribunal appeals for local authorities to make better decisions in the first place uh, and properly comply with the law rather than put these extra hurdles in the way? So one having pose those questions, you can imagine what my response is going to be to question six. To what extent do you agree or disagree with the overall approach to strengthen redress? I'll have a look at the Q&A on these points that may have come in. Please, again, if I could encourage people not to uh, use the comments section for, sorry, the, the Q&A for comments. And also, a number of the questions are asking me things that clearly I don't know the answer to. So will there be any help for parents who are disabled or have English as a second language to reply to the consultation. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. It's something we have to take up with the government. And what I know is what's on um, on the website, the same as uh, everyone else has seen. Um, what sort of costs are we talking about for mediation? There shouldn't be any costs associated with it unless you're going to instruct a lawyer. And that will then be a matter for you and your lawyer to, to negotiate some. If it becomes a mandatory stage in the process, I imagine some of the specialist uh, lawyers in the area will offer a fixed price deal. You can, you can pay if you can afford it to have either free mediation advice or representation at the mediation itself. But I'm absolutely certain the government will want to encourage people to have lawyers present. But then if a local authority is going to have their solicitor providing advice in the background or attending the mediation, I imagine many parents would want the same thing. Um, So where parents are themselves disabled, how would the Equality Act apply to a requirement to mediate? Yes, absolutely. Well, it depends if, the, if there's an absolute duty, as there might be in primary legislation to go through mediation, then the Equality Act can't change that. The only thing that you could argue is that that is incompatible with the Human Rights Act in, and incompatible with Article 14 of the European Convention on Human Rights. If, part, if the court agreed, Parliament, there could be a declaration of incompatibility. So Parliament would have to think again about whether or not that's an appropriate requirement. Um, but if it's about how the mediation functions, unless there's a statutory duty to do it in a particular way, then the process of mediation, of course, would be subject to the reasonable adjustments duty. Yes, on the question of the judicial review that I mentioned before about the uh, ombudsman refusing to investigate certain complaints that are commonly arising in the SEND area, then um, the, the, the hearing in that case has happened and we're waiting for the judgment at the moment. Will mediation now be necessary for Section I only? It's a great question because it's not necessary to get a mediation certificate, if I remember rightly. For section I only appeals. I think that's another point of detail that we just don't know the answer to from the green paper itself. And, and another great question, what about young people over 16? What, how will they engage with this? Well, of course, people will be aware that if the young person has capacity in relation to making their own decisions as to a tribunal appeal, they are expected to bring the tribunal appeal themselves. The parents can act as their helper and supporter. If they lack capacity, then under the Children and Families Act, uh, parents automatically have the right to bring the appeal unless there's a different deputy or attorney appointed uh, under the Mental Capacity Act. One assumes the same approach will happen with, with mandatory mediation. So if a 17-year-old has capacity, they'll be expected to conduct the mediation themselves with support from their parents. If they lack capacity, then that right or obligation will transfer to uh, the parents. But again, that's a very important point that uh, I suggest needs to be flagged in the uh, responses. Another very important point about digital exclusion, parents who may only be able to access EHC plans on their phone, how are you going to be able to work with a digital EHC plan if you don't have a laptop, for example. And also the, the fundamental importance that records are kept uh, accurately if we're going to move everything online. A question about young people post 18 with complex needs. 
um, where education is deemed no longer a benefit, is it possible to still have an EHC plan with health needs under Section G funded by the CCG? And the answer to that is no, and will, I think, continue to be no. The, the EHC plan will continue to be education-led. And if you don't have a significant educational need that requires significant additional educational provision, then you cannot have an EHC plan and you fall back on statutory schemes in relation to health and social care, most obviously the Care Act for adults. But in terms of therapy provision, that will be the local NHS adult services uh, without any kind of clear statutory duty, individualised statutory duty, giving you a right to those services. So that's the next of the um, questions that we've seen. And now um, two bits of commentary under this heading. The first year tribunal plays an important role in resolving disputes, yes. Appeals to the tribunal should only, be, only need to be made in cases where parents feel. Isn't it interesting how parents always feel things as opposed to things being objectively the case? That their child's needs or proposed provision arrangements are not in line with the new national standards mediation has not resolved the dispute. Well, that's if the national, new national standards are right. I would say, I mean, how can the child's needs not be in line with the national standards? I don't understand that. I can see how you could, challenge, you could say, well, the proposed provision arrangement must be in line with the new national standards. But what's wrong with the current system here, if it was operating properly, where you assess individual needs, put in place provision to meet those needs, name a school placement where that provision all or most of it can be delivered. And if the parent disagrees with any of those things, you can appeal to the independent tribunal that adjudicates. What's wrong with that as an approach? Why is it necessary to have this additional complexity and bureaucracy if the focus is, is primarily on uh, ensuring needs are appropriately identified quickly and met quickly? Uh, if the intention is to stop people appealing to the tribunal and reducing the number of tribunal appeals, I can see why you'd go down this avenue, but that isn't the stated intention. Tribunal decisions will be made in line with the new statutory national standard and alternative provision standards. So it seems that the judges will no longer have um, broad discretion to uh, the judges and the members, the panels of the tribunal, will no longer have broad discretion as to what provision is ordered in the plans. They'll have to apply the national standards, which is uh, an interesting way of working in terms of whether the tribunal will be truly an independent creature anymore. And then in terms of um, health and social care, What's being said is that the extended powers here will continue. So the tribunal will still be able to make non-binding recommendations about health needs, social care provision. Why do we have to have a different approach in relation to health and social care than we have in relation to education? Why can't the tribunal just make binding orders in relation to health and social care? That isn't answered here. All that's said is that the, the extended powers enable parents and carers to access a single route of redress across education, health and care? Well, not really, because in cases where my clients have complex health or social care needs, I may well be saying, look, you need to progress this by way of judicial review because the tribunal can only make a non-binding recommendation and this is too urgent, it needs to be sorted out. My view is that the decision-making so far has been unlawful. And so this is something we'll have to go to the High Court about. If the tribunal had greater powers, equal powers across education, health and social care, that might not be necessary. So there's a, there's a lot missing, I would suggest, in paragraph 33. And here we have, I think at last, some discussion of the Equality Act. The Equality Act makes clear that schools must operate inclusively and ensure that children and young people who are disabled can access and participate in education and other activities schools provide. Yes, however, where this is not the case, the practices may have been discriminatory. Families and young people are able to bring a claim to the to the tribunal, which has the power to award a range of remedies to address the wrong, with the aim of putting a child and young person's education back on track. These remedies can include training of school staff and ordering a change to school policies. What they can't include at the moment is an award of damages. It's not expressly stated to be the case here, but is the case under the Equality Act. And there's a judicial review claim happening next month, a hearing happening next month, where it's being argued by two families that the fact that they couldn't claim damages when uh, children who say they've been discriminated against by their school on the basis of their race or their sex can claim damages in the county court, as can 
disabled students in further or, or higher education as well. It's only disabled students at school who are not able to claim damages. And, and it's being said that the Equality Act is itself unlawful and discriminatory in that way and breaches the Human Rights Act. And if that's right, there would be a declaration of incompatibility made and Parliament would have to think about what to do about that. But the government is saying here in broad terms that they're proposing to explore those issues. Do you consider the current remedies available to the tribunal? They're effective. It might be helpful, one might think, for it to be said here that uh, the, the thing the tribunal can't do is award damages. So that's chapter two, which I think, as I said, contains the majority of the legal changes. Let's go back to the Q&A to see if there are any uh, more questions on that. Will the proposals affect the, the route of national address pilots? So we, that's what we were talking about in terms of the tribunal. So the short answer is no. So after the national trial, you've now got bedded in uh, this, the new system, which allows the tribunal to make non-binding recommendations on health and social care. And that's going to continue, it said, without any explanation as to why it's only appropriate for there to be non-binding recommendations in this area. Is it, how is it fair? Is it fair perhaps that local authorities use public funds to appoint barristers to the tribunal and yet parents have no similar recourse? I personally think no. I think any local authority uh, who instructs counsel in a tribunal should be required to make the same amount of funding available for parents to have representation of their choice. Uh, that's not the, the current law, nor I think is it likely to be the current law at any point. Uh, but that's certainly what I think should be the case morally. I'm not, I'm not suggesting it's legally required, but it does feel to me to be unfair in broad terms for local authorities to be able to use public funds to defend tribunal appeals when parents don't have funding to bring them. In terms of having national standards on provision, does that mean that assessments are incomplete because a therapist or a professional can only recommend what's in the standards, so you need to see the assessment? Yeah, it's a very important point, isn't it? I mean, I can see why national standards could be a guideline, but if they're going to be a rigid rule, you absolutely, <laughs> it's gonna be very interesting to see how, how you can make them so comprehensive that the needs and provision for every single child is sent properly is reflected within them. I wouldn't want to have to write those, put it that way. Um, in terms of tribunals and um, part of the overriding theme of this talk in terms of securing compliance with the law, whatever it is. A uh, question about costs, when local authorities might have to pay costs. There's no suggestion here that that's going to change. And the current law is that local, local authorities would have to behave unreasonably in order to be uh, ordered to pay costs. And the definition of unreasonable behavior in this context is incredibly high. It means vexatious, conduct that's designed to harass. Uh, so it's not just basic incompetence, it's got to be either deliberate or and or incredibly bad behavior. And so, as the question suggests, and I agree, it's almost impossible to get costs. It's very, very difficult uh, for parents to get costs. And that's not, I would suggest, a major part of um, any kind of enforcement scheme at the moment. It's, a, it's more of a theoretical than a real issue. I'm asked to explain what's meant by a child's needs not fitting into standards. I, I can't explain that, I don't understand. How the, how the standards are going to work in relation to needs. I can understand how they can work at least in principle in relation to provision, but in relation to needs, I just don't understand um, how that can work. A um, couple of interesting questions again about the tribunal. Is, this is a leading question. Is it unhelpful having local, untrained local authority staff in tribunals? Is it better when there are barristers involved? I think it's always better when barristers are involved in everything, obviously. Uh, no, I think, there are situations where it's appropriate for both parties to have counsel. There are lots and lots of other appeals where that sort of counsel are unnecessary. And the solution, I don't think, is necessarily routine instruction of counsel. The, the, the solution is to make sure that local authority staff are properly trained and do properly understand the law and do know what points to argue and what points to concede. Um, can it be confirmed that the Sendias service, the Information Advice and Support Service, provides tribunal representation? that's a matter that you need to take up with them or, or the national uh, body because there's no legal obligation as far as i know to do so nor as far as i know is there any uh, strict legal impediment on people doing so but that's something that would need to be uh, taken up 
with them. It's not something that, um, that I can give a definitive a ruling on. Of course, I can't give a definitive ruling on anything. That's a matter for uh, judges. So thank you very much again for those questions. I've seen if there's anything more. How will the new system deal with children with very complex needs who have multiple needs? Well, I think that's a great question because my fear is that the answer to that might be badly. Because looking at this, the whole emphasis is on reducing needs, minimizing requirements for statutory support, having needs met early, having needs met by mainstream schools. And these are all laudable goals, but not if the system then can't cope with the fact that there are some children who just have inherently very complicated needs. And I would suggest there isn't enough of focus in here on how to make sure that the system achieves really good outcomes for that cohort. And that's a concern that needs to be pointed out, I would say. Who decides what ordinarily available looks like and how is reasonable to be defined? Great question. Well, these are all questions that arise under the current scheme. And the answer to the current scheme is local authorities get to decide everything, having had uh, a conversation with families. And if people don't like it, they can go and ask the tribunal to referee. And I ask my same rhetorical question that I asked before. What's wrong with that in principle? It seems to me like a rather fair system. So you've got the local authority who has to deal with the competing imperatives of meeting the child's needs, but also not wasting public money, perfectly legitimate point. So we meet needs in a cost-effective way. And if parents feel that the local authority have got that wrong, struck the balance in the wrong place, the tribunal's there to referee. I don't see what in principle is wrong with that and why we need to mandate additional layers of bureaucracy to prevent the tribunal uh, doing its statutory job. How does co-production with parents work when the proposal states the local authority will suggest to select a list of what they think are appropriate schools? Well, it may be that we don't know because there's hardly any detail on this proposal or anything like that. It may be that the list of schools will itself be co-produced with parents. I imagine it will be generally and perhaps specifically in that child's individual case. But at the end of the day, it will still be the local authority deciding, it seems, which schools the family can choose from. Whereas at the moment, the families can choose, from any, choose any school and then the local authority gets to make the ultimate decision, which again seems to me to be a perfectly reasonable way of doing things. I'm not sure why. That would need to change. Interesting question about having a pre-selected list of schools being uh, effectively being a blanket policy, uh, as would banding, so allocating band funding bands. The way that the system has dealt with all of that up till now is it's all fine to have policies because at the end of the day, you've got these underpinning duties that require individualized uh, provisions to be made to meet individual needs. But it is problematic, I think, to have, the, uh, have a pre-selected list, the concept of a pre-selected list set out in legislation. And it will give rise to questions as to whether that, that new legislation is human rights compliant, I suggest. We do, of course, still have a Human Rights Act at the moment. There were proposed changes to the Human Rights Act as well. So we'll have to see how all this fits together. But at present, you will be able to say that any new legislation like this uh, was, for example, discriminatory contrary to Article 14 of the convention and should be declared incompatible on that basis. So having seeing how the jigsaw of new legislation fits together will be very important in that regard. A question about uh, Senate reviews and annual reviews where there is no EHC plan. Well, there's no requirement for an annual review in the formal sense where a child doesn't have an EHC plan. You're then at the, at the SEN support process, which is not, as I say, a legal process. It's a policy process, and the best thing I can do is say, look at the code of practice in terms of how that's supposed to work. There is a chapter on SEN support. Any comment in the review on the role of the independent education sector in pushing costs up, being a direct result of the public sector not providing such schools themselves? There may well be, but that's probably in the bits of the review that I haven't paid so much attention to, because that's more of a policy in an economics question than, than a legal question. We're not going to have time to look through all of that today. Um, so a question earlier on about the, the reduction in parental choice. Is it my understanding that parents will still be able to appeal by the tribunal for placements not on the list? I'm not sure. It's not clear whether that's how it's going to work or not. 
because if it is going to work that way, then it would seem that all that, that having the pre-selected list will do is increase the number of tribunal appeals because parents will say, well, thank you. I don't want any of these six. What I wanted is school X over there. And the local authority would say, well, that's not on the list. Terribly sorry. In which case the parents will say, right, I'll go to tribunal then, having gone through appointment mediation and, and local dispute resolution exercise perhaps. So it's all very concerning, I would suggest, and doesn't seem to me to, to offer any particular benefit for um, children, young people, or families at all to reduce the choice of placements that they have. A very fair point, I think from earlier on as well, that the green and white papers are very content heavy. School parents, local authorities might have the resources and time to go through. Absolutely, I completely agree. Uh, it's very important that those who are able to engage with this do, because not everyone will be able to. Uh, and we need as many responses as possible. Of course, focusing on what people think the big issues are, you're not obliged to respond on every point, but respond on as many points as you can. Question about social, emotional, mental health needs within a new EHC plan. I don't think there's any suggestion at the moment that the four categories of need will change. Of course, it's absolutely right, as the question suggests, that there's increasing concerns around social, emotional, mental health, SEMH, post-pandemic. Uh, but there's already the requirement for the EHC plan to identify those needs and to put provision in place to meet them. So I don't see that there's likely to be any changes in that area, nothing I've seen. Um, does the review do anything to prevent local authorities using the need to appeal and tribunals as a delaying tactic? Uh, no, in fact, I think probably the opposite. I would suggest that um, mediation, compulsory mediation and uh, local dispute resolution, if it happens, would, it, would, would inherently increase delay. Uh, and making mediation compulsory, I don't see it as being likely to result in better outcomes for children and young people at all. Are there any plans for pathfinders? That's really interesting, isn't it? Someone remembers the way that the Children and Families Bill reforms were introduced. I'm not sure if that's the way it's going to go. I think that will probably be clear, clearer, at least in the next stage, when the um, decisions are essentially being taken as a result of uh, the consultation. So a very important question about accountability and whether the mechanisms here are going to be sufficient to address it. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, what's not, there are various forms of accountability in the system, but the one that doesn't involve individual families challenging through the courts or tribunals is the inspection regime. And I'm not sure how much there is, if anything, we haven't seen it yet, about what the enhanced role, what any enhanced role for the inspectorates would be in this context. So it's very difficult to identify um, how best to deliver accountability within a, a complex system like this. The way that things work at the moment is that individuals who have a grievance can bring a complaint or a legal claim. And the systemic response to check that things are going well, or at least tolerably well, is through the inspectorate. So it's very important that the inspectorates are, are looking at the right things with sufficient uh, robustness and, and regularity. Okay, so let's look at what else uh, we've got in the review before we move on. So we've got just briefly, I'll just, um, go through these, ex these further chapters to skim for any legal content. Chapter three, is about improving the standards of provision, excellent provision from early years to adulthood, looking for a more inclusive system. So we're seeing additional funding investment, that's not for today, a new Senko National Professional Qualification, which is sort of a legal issue. So that's, that's of some relevance for today. Uh, more research, improving main provision, linking to the schools bill and the schools white paper. Funding more than 10,000 additional respite placements through an investment of 30 million pounds. I would just pause there to note that when Aiming High for Disabled Children came out in 2008, the investment 
of local authority funding for short rents was 500 million pounds. And there was an additional um, 500 million, I think I've got those figures right, for NHS funding as well. Um, so it was, it was magnitude different to what's being proposed or what's being said here. Uh, of course, all additional money is welcome, but that's much, much less than was being um, provided under Amy Hyde for disabled children. Uh, a clear timeline about 2030, all children will benefit from being taught in a family of schools and some specific funding for supported internships. But not much there that is specific to uh, legal change. We'll skip through this. So if I'm giving anyone a headache by scrolling through. Is the new Senco qualification, which, as I say, is, is, is law related. It says it's a formal national qualification. Seems like a good idea to me, but that's lovely people who are much better in the place than I am to um, comment on that. Strengthening the relationship between the Sen governor and the Senco. Improving timely access to specialist support. This seems to be about policy and money as opposed to law. Although this is interesting, I think, and, and is law related. The existing functions of the designated clinical officers, DCOs, and designated medical officers, BMOs, and supporting health commissioners. And so they're going to have, it's suggested, a new role of designated health officer that would actually go into the uh, same kind of practice. Seems like a very good thing. No, currently no provision for an equivalent designated officer in social care. Uh, it seems needs to be a DISCO, a designated social care officer. I would say, again, that's a very good idea. So we have the accountability and named people who are responsible for um, those areas. Although noting, of course, adult social care is relevant here as well. And then investing in high quality specialist placements. So picking up the question about children with complex needs, we understand that for some children and young people, specialist provision will be the most appropriate placement for them. So that is stated in terms. A, a desire to avoid children and young people being educated outside their local area, which I think is, is obviously right as a policy intention and the commitment to, to funding for its experience over the next three years. And then families of schools being part of a strong trust. You've got these case studies as to how things are going to work. Transition to further education. Your apprenticeships. None of that is specifically law related. So then we move on to chapter four, which is the specific chapter about alternative provision one on one analysis. We could have had a separate document on alternative provision, but clearly it's seen that alternative provision needs to be uh, integrated here within uh, the SEND uh, review. And again, it's the similar approach, a national vision for alternative provision. The vision will be delivered by an integrated SEND and alternative provision system with clear national standards. And they had like proposals, making alternative provision an integral part of local SEND systems by requiring the new local partnerships to plan and deliver an AEP service. So the SEND partnerships that we saw being created earlier will also be responsible for the alternative provision in the area. Funding stability for alternative provision schools sounds like a very good idea. Again, not, not, my, not really my area. Building system capacity through multi-academy trust, similar point, bespoke performance framework, and then greater oversight and transparency of people movements in and out of alternative provision. That's very important, I would say, and more research corporate evidence. So what, what is alternative provision? A wide provider base including people referral units or crews, alternative provision academies and free schools, independent schools, unregistered providers, medical and hospital schools. The number of children and young people in alternative provision is small. Most of them haven't been found to be excluded and the outcomes are poor, as we know. What's going wrong at the moment? Well, it's not dissimilar to the analysis around the SEND system more generally. 
providers are small and often operating in isolation. So there's definitely a, what seemed to be a lack of strategic um, capacity within the system. Results in a system where children and young people arrive in alternative vision too late and go on to achieve poor outcomes. So we're going to have a new national vision offering timely and world-class support. And, they, and the, the intention is that people should stay in or return to mainstream schools or colleges. But decisions about support and placements will always be in the best interest of the child or young person, importantly. So this is interesting because we we've, we've get start to get an explanation as to why this is being put together. So although the majority of children and young people in alternative provision have some form of SEM, it serves a distinct purpose that is different to special schools, primarily supporting children and young people to stay in or reintegrate back into mainstream education. It should not be used simply because a child or young person is identified with SEM. So this isn't all children with SEND or lots of children with SEND should end up in alternative provision. Although I can see the risk that um, some mixed messages might occur here. And there's then going to be a three tier system of support, targeted support in the mainstream, time limited placements and alternative provision and transitional placements. A time limited placements and alternative provision is, is challenging, I think, in the SEND context, because as we know, under the Children and Families Act, you can have education otherwise than at school indefinitely if that's uh, appropriate and necessary to meet your needs. So there's no time limit in the current statutory scheme. Will that change uh, if, if and when we get a new bill resulting from this? We shall see. So that's a point that people might want to pick up in response to question 13. Local delivery. We've talked about the, the need for more, uh, better structured commissioning and better, better strategic planning in relation to this area. Not an awful lot here that's to do with the law, so I'll skip through. Building capacity, this is the financial uh, section again, so I'm going to skip through that. System is set up for success. Bespoke a bespoke national alternative provision performance framework. Query whether that will be uh, embedded in the law or not. Interesting. Five key outcomes here, including, of course, reintegration, as we would expect and improving oversight, no comprehensive statutory framework for pupil movements at the moment. That is problematic. I would strongly agree with that. And so um, they want to review how children and young people move around the school system, including through offsite direction and unregulated managed moves, with a view to introducing a statutory framework for all pupil movements. I would, I would very much support that. That's an extremely good idea. So that's chapter four. Before we do chapter five, I'll just pop back to the Q&A and see if there are any new questions. Is there enough safeguard to prevent off-rolling? I'm not sure there is, and I'm not sure there's enough of a recognition here that uh, of the vulnerability of children and young people uh, with SEND to being off-rolled, unlawfully excluded. Uh, there's a case called CHF, uh, a recent, relatively recent judgment that approves the power of schools and local authorities to work together to direct a child uh, to be educated off-site for safeguarding reasons. So there are rather more uh, sophisticated and nuanced understanding um, here, I think, is necessary. Uh, interesting to see that some comments are coming on the Q&A about the positive uh, potential connotations of, of mediation, which is good to hear, but also a concern uh, that making mediation compulsory will, will put people off, including those who are disabled themselves as parents, of English as a second language, all that absolutely has to be taken into account. And I would suggest these to be pointed out in consultation responses. What qualifications will the, do the designated medical officer, designated clinical officer hold, will the new designated health officer hold, will the um, designated social care officer hold if you have one. Don't know, we'll, we'll wait to see what the code of practice says about that. Query about the national banding system. It doesn't cover the cost of provision in section F and the school don't provide the support. Won't the parents then take the local authority to judicial review for not providing the contents of section F? Yes, that's what, what uh, any competent lawyer would advise them to do. And that will therefore mean that the local authority may have to deviate from the banding system. Well, yes, as long as there is still a specific duty to secure the provision that the individual child needs, 
then the bans can only ever be indicative. And in the cases that I've been involved in, where challenges have been made to banding systems operated by local authorities, the local authorities are always very clear that if necessary, they would go above bans. They would fund in between bans. They would fund above the highest bans because they recognised that their ultimate duty was to ensure that the child's individual needs were met. And the national system will have to operate in the same way. Otherwise, local authorities will be routinely driven uh, to make unlawful decisions if they have to comply with rigid bans. Very interesting question. What's not in the review? What's missing? Well, I do think that it's a missed opportunity in relation to uh, making education, health and care plans genuinely about the child's the young, young person's education, health and care altogether. Although, of course, the problem with doing that is that you would then create a real gold standard and anyone who had significant levels of need in any area would want an EHC plan. And there would be a two tier system for those, for example, who have lower levels of care needs who would only have a, a care and support plan under the Care Act. And I can see why that would be objectionable. So there are problems with it, but, but the, the current fudge, I would suggest, in terms of education, the fullest set of entitlements around education and a lesser package in relation to health and social care for the HC plans is, is quite difficult to defend. It seems to me it's hard to find a principled basis for that. Uh, and I think the other thing that is missing so far is more is enough on accountability and how how it's going to be how whatever statutory system we end up with after this, which frankly I don't think is going to look that different apart from potentially in relation to choice of placement. How will that be monitored? How will the implementation of that be monitored? How is it going to be achieved this time? Because doing the same thing as was done last time is very likely, one would think, to lead to the same results, which are set out in rather graphic terms in the introductory chapters. Okay, so uh, chapter five, system roles, accountability and funding reform. So much here again that won't be to do with the law. Uh, clarity in roles and responsibilities. Perhaps arguably they should have that already. Uh, equipping the new regions group to take responsibility again, that's policy. Statutory guidance to the new integrated care boards, that's going to have a legal consequence because statutory guidance was issued under an act to set out clearly how the statutory responsibilities of the Senate should be discharged. So the ICBs will have to then issue their own notes essentially locally. New inclusion dashboards offering a timely, transparent picture of how the system is performing, whether that's going to be a legal requirement, we'll see. New national framework of banding and price tariffs is what we were just talking about. And working with CQC on us. Ah, so here we go. So here is the accountability point. The local areas can send the correct inspection framework. Uh, will be updated. We'll see the need for that in a moment. See what's supposed to accrue. System accountabilities. Process to strengthen accountabilities through a range of measures. Holding local authorities and MOTs to account for uh, local delivery. So this new regions group leading system regulation. DfE in its role as the regulator, interesting description there of the department, will enter into new funding agreements. Monitoring ongoing delivery against local inclusion plans, clear ladder of intervention. It's definitely, uh, I would suggest, a, a greater focus this time around on practical action being needed to actually and secure implementation, as opposed to just assuming that one passes legislation and things just get done. So definitely a lot of weight being placed on the new regions group. Then the health system, system oversight framework that's operating through NHS England and NHS improvement. And there's plan, plan, the plan is that there will be statutory guidance as said, or in relation to the new uh, integrated commissioning boards, ICBs. And NICE has also recently published new guidelines around support that disabled children and young people with severe and complex needs should receive. And so the NICE guidelines are very important in terms of standard setting. The one for autism, for example, is well worth looking for those if you're interested in those areas. Making better use of data. Every review ever commissioned has said that. And how they're going to do it. Again, not particularly law related, but very important. Updating performance metrics for education providers, also very important. 
and here we are working with Ofsted to update the local area assembly and AP inspection framework so that the inspections will continue to have an important role in the system with a focus on how local delivery of services, including health and care, which seems rather obvious, impacts the experience, progress and outcomes for children and young people with SEND. Government is pleased with the plan for a new local area inspection framework from 2023, ongoing cycle of inspections and visits, uh, linking to the liberty protection safeguard scheme. We haven't even mentioned that yet. This is the new scheme that replaces the deprivation of liberty safeguards under the Mental Capacity Act and will apply to 16 and 17 year olds uh, for the first time. So um, there'll be lots of authorizations given, for example, residential special schools, residential colleges, where people need to be deprived of their liberty and said in accordance um, with their own best interests and to keep them safe, uh, whether or not that scheme is working effectively to prevent people being unlawfully and unnecessarily deprived of liberty. Uh, and a close look at children under five, those age 16 to 25, and those in AP, all good. But it's not said here what the review of the framework following this implementation will result in, because we don't know yet what the new framework is going to be, obviously. But there is at least a recognition that the Ofsted inspections and CPC inspections are going to be hugely important. Funding reform. Okay, so we propose funding changes to help make the most effective use of the investment in high needs funding. What's, what I'm looking for this at, uh, at this for as a lawyer is, okay, have you recognised the fact that there is this absolute duty to secure the particular provision that the individual child or young person needs? So paragraph 28, we're told, but as part of the new system, we propose the introduction of a new national framework for banding and price counts for high needs funding, matched to levels of need and types of provision within the staff. Bandings with cluster specific types of education provision aligned to need as set out by national standards. Tariffs would set the rules and prices that commissioners use to pay providers. Draw upon similar examples in local authorities and other services like the NHS. Tariffs would ensure the right pricing structures are in place, helping to control high costs, which you can see the value of, absolutely. They will be developed to appropriately reflect need, including the most complex needs that sufficiently meet the cost of provision. Well, that's the acid test, isn't it? Do they do that? Designed to give providers clarity on how much funding they should expect to receive, receive in delivering support or a service. Yes, but if you've got a very bespoke and very unusual set of needs with provision to match those needs, is it going to work within this stratified and structured system? We know most local authorities already use banded funding arrangements. National framework will be more consistent. I, I agree with that. I think it's better to have a, a transparency, consistency of this at a national level rather than what could be quite opaque local arrangements. All specialist providers will need to ensure the provision they offer is in line with the national standards if they're to continue receiving placements funded by the local authority. So there's a real reach in here by the centre to say, no, we're going to set the terms of the engagement here and decide how that provision is to be made. We don't underestimate the challenge and complexity of developing a national framework of banding tariffs. Good, because it's going to be incredibly challenging and incredibly complex, I would say. But what again is missing here, and in terms of answering question 18, is a recognition that at the end of the day, unless you're going to take away one of the fundamental building blocks of this scheme, local authorities will have to secure whatever provision is in an EHC plan, regardless of how much it costs. So how do you square that circle of saying, no, we're going to have national bans and tariffs, we're going to restrict price inflation, we're going to stop providers ripping off the system. But look, we've got Johnny over there who needs a specific package of support, and it's going to cost more than the national banding system allows us to spend. What do you do in that situation? I don't have an answer to that. But the officials will need to, uh, and, the, and most importantly, of course, the minister will need to, if this is going to be implemented in a way that doesn't cut across that core statutory duty. There's then some work on early years funding, the school's notional SEN budget, which will be standardised calculation of that budget in uh, full implementation of the direct national funding formula for mainstream schools. The department will determine budget allocations. It's all very centralised, isn't it? And so on. And then chapter six is on delivering change. And I'm conscious that we're nearly out of time, so I'll have a little look at that. Uh, and what they're going to do is invest more money immediately, bring a uh, task the, the department directorate to work with system leaders to develop the national standards, have a, a change program, 70 million pounds of change program to test and refine key proposals, uh, echoing that pathfinder comment, and then a delivery plan saying how it's all going to be done and a national send delivery board. 
which again are all really policy initiatives that the that others who are on this call are probably going to be better placed than I am to comment on. So we know that in terms of next steps, there was a consultation process that was then extended as a result of uh, the need to uh, allow people to consider the easy read and I think the children's version as well. So we saw the, the new date and when we came in. And it's again vital that as many people as possible respond. Is there anything else you would like to say about the proposals in the, in the green paper? Do please make liberal use of uh, question 22 as you see appropriate. And there's a list of consultation questions. So that's our whistle stop tour through the green paper. I'll just go back to the QA for the last couple of minutes and see if there are any more questions that um, I need to answer. So, a question about will is there a potential for top up charges for parents, such as those implemented following the 30 hours of free childcare? I very much hope not because that's been, that would be the antithesis to the current system, which is about making sure that children's needs are met by statutory provision. So it would require new legislation that I would strongly oppose if uh, that was to be, if a top-up charge uh, system was to be introduced. What am I expecting the timing of all this to be? I wouldn't begin to uh, guess. All I can say is, as I mentioned before, one expects there normally is a white paper that follows a green paper, and then a draft bill, and then a bill. So a time scale that's measured in years rather than months, I would suggest. Beyond that, uh, that's definitely a question to direct to the department. What's missing from local authority inspections at the moment is a really good question. And I think people, though the special needs jungle team have done loads of work analysing the um, local authority area inspections so far. Uh, I think like any system, the quality of the inspections uh, may be variable. And are, are they asking the right questions? And are they properly um, analysing whether the law has been complied with? Which, as a lawyer, of course, I think is the most important thing they can be doing. Others may disagree. But I think those who've been the subject of inspections or who've read the inspection reports for their area are probably best placed to comment on how well the current inspection process is working. Very interesting question about attendance, behaviour and exclusion. Not there isn't much of a reference to uh, school exclusion in the green paper, I don't think, uh, and it's obviously a very important issue. Let's just do a fine exclusion within the green paper, preventing exclusions from the Autism Education Trust it's exclusively. All right. So there's going to be the vision. I presume that's the vision for alternative provision. Yes. It's linked to the statutory potential permanent exclusion guidance. So the new system of alternative provision over time will reduce the number of preventable exclusions is the intention. I think that's it. Now we're in the glossary. Yeah, so not much in short. And I think that would be part of my critique of the green paper. Is it's quite thin, I think, in terms of demonstrating a, a really full understanding of what's happening in the system at the moment, what's going wrong. There's a, definitely a broad understanding of what's going wrong, it's said in quite stark terms. Um, but in terms of the level of detail of the system complexity and how all the bits of it fit together, for example, behaviour attendance and exclusion, and the agenda around that needs to be as plugged into this as, as the schools bill and the schools white paper is. It's a very complex system, of course, and I would be concerned that we haven't yet really grappled, those responsible haven't yet really grappled with what it would take to achieve the, the laudable aims that are set out in here. So thanks very much, everyone. I hope it's been a uh, helpful session today. Uh, the overarching message is please respond. Respond in whatever way you're able to, with others, as part of a group, don't feel that you have to provide a comprehensive response to every question. If you've only got time to respond to one question, do that. But please don't miss the opportunity to have your say because uh, consultations are only as valuable as the um, people who respond to them make them. And uh, if people don't respond, then there's uh, little point in the government consulting and they'll just go ahead with whatever they think is the right thing to do. So do take that opportunity and do, I'm sure there'll be resources and there are already resources being produced by a number of the 
charities to support responses. And uh, I, I hope that um, through everyone's efforts, what's being proposed ends up being something that is capable of delivering uh, the vision of the SAO in here. Right, thank you very much, Steve. Um, I hope everybody found that very useful and insightful. Um, just a reminder that this session has been recorded and will be available on the Seashell YouTube channel uh, within the week. Um, we will also be sent out a survey for everybody's feedback. Um, and also just a reminder, we will be host having another webinar with Steve, um, which is going to be on the 17th of June, which is our Transitions to Adulthood um, session, which will cover, also cover the Mental Capacity Act and the CARE Act. Um, so just again, a very big thank you to Steve. Um, we sure. look forward to your next session. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks, and just to remind you. everybody as well, please visit www.tshelltrust.org.uk and visit our What's On page to see any future upcoming sessions that we're going to be doing. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I'd like to say goodbye. And hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye.